project is mainly about prime patterns. And just for a really quick review, I'm going to review what a prime number is. So a prime number is just a number whose only factors are one in itself. And you might also be wondering, like, what are these prime patterns? So more specifically, the patterns that we're interested in are the patterns of remainders when these primes are divided by integers. And for the remainder of this uh, talk, we'll mostly be, con be, be uh, considering the case where the integer we're dividing by is 3. So let's consider the, sequences of uh, the sequence of primes p, n in increasing order. So p1 is equal to 2, p2 is equal to 3, p3 is equal to 5, and so on. And so before we investigate the nature of these patterns, let's actually talk about, OK, for the specific case of dividing by 3, what are the possible remainders? Well, the possible remainders are 0, 1, and 2, but the remainder can't be 0 because if the prime left the remainder of 0 when divided by 3, then it would be a multiple of 3, and no primes other than 3 can be a multiple of 3. So we're only interested in the remainders 1 and 2. So the question we ask is, how often do primes leave a remainder of 2 when they're divided by 3, or leave a remainder of 1 when divided by 3? And I'm going to highlight in the table uh, the primes in the table that leave a remainder of 2 when divided by 3. So as before, the, the notation pn is congruent to 2 mod 3 just means that when the prime is divided by 3, it leaves a remainder of 2. And so since the only possible remainders are 1 and 2, one might hope that the frequencies of these remainders are roughly equal. So there are roughly equal number of primes that leave a remainder of 1 and 2. And it turns out that this is actually true. This intuition is true by the theorem called Dirichlet's theorem. And that just says that if you're given an integer q and you look at all the possible remainders when primes are divided by the integer, the primes are roughly equally distributed among those remainders. So that's only looking at one prime at a time. What if we want to look at more primes? And not just one, but let's say two or three or even more. So if we look at pairs of consecutive primes, pn and pn plus one, we can look at these patterns of length two. So here we have the pattern where pn is congruent to 2 and pn plus 1 is congruent to 1 mod 3. And I've highlighted again an example of, this, of such a pattern. And of course, we can go to triples and so on. So I'm about to show you a graph that helps you visualize what I mean by this proportion of primes that satisfy these patterns. So here is, it is in the simple case. So uh, the x-axis in this graph is a number of primes that we're considering. So for example, let's consider the first 2,000 primes. What proportion of those primes leave a remainder of 1 when divided by 3? And what proportion of the primes leave a remainder of 2 when divided by 3? Here, uh, the blue data is the proportion that leave a remainder of 1. And the red data is a proportion that leaves a remainder of 2. And as you can see, the, the two trend lines seem to converge pretty rapidly to 50-50, which, which is pretty uh, reassuring. So that is sort of, even if we didn't know Dirichlet's theorem, this is sort of evidence that we should try to prove something like this. But Dirichlet's theorem tells us that this is indeed true, so that we're good in this case. But if we look at longer patterns, so if we look at pairs of primes and not just one prime at a time, it turns out that there's some spooky behavior. Here. Uh, the black line, the black dashed line, is what we would expect if we just generalize Dirichlet's theorem to longer prime sequences. So what I mean by that is the following. Let's, let's look at how many possible patterns there are of pairs of primes when we take the remainders when divided by 3. So each individual prime can have two possible remainders, 1 and 2. So there are 2 times 2 equals 4 possible uh, remainders for the pair of primes. And so Naively, we would expect that the frequency should be roughly one fourth or 0.25, and that's exactly what's shown by the black dashed line. But if you look at the other data, uh, data points, they seem to be, it's not even clear if they converge at all to the expected line of the 0.25. And some of them are above and some of them are below, so we'd like to actually explain why this kind of spooky behavior occurs. And so, uh, we're going to do that by appealing to statements like the prime number theorem we'll introduce right now. So uh, as many of you probably know, Euclid's proof of the infinitude of primes uh, doesn't, it only tells us something about how, that there are infinitely many primes, but it doesn't tell us much about how those primes are actually distributed. So the prime number theorem actually tells us something of, of use to us. So uh, the prime number theorem tells us that the number of primes below a certain value grows like this following function. 
And the important thing to note about this uh, function is that it's an integral of, of the form one over log. And that's really what we want to get out of this. And our goal is to explain these frequencies of prime patterns by a statement that's similar to the prime number theorem. And so a paper by Robert Lemke Oliver and Sounder Rajan, who I'll henceforth refer to as Sound because that's how he likes to be referred to, uh, and I should clarify that Lemke Oliver is one person. Uh, he just doesn't have a hyphenated name. Uh, there is some confusion about that. So what they say is that given a prime pattern frequency, uh, it can be described by this following formula. And this is pretty complicated, as you might see, like just looking at this. It's a little menacing, but I've highlighted the parts that we actually want to care about. So the boxed and highlighted part is a, par is a part of the conjecture that is similar to the prime number theorem. So there's a one over log y squared. And the squared term comes from the fact that we're looking at uh, pairs of primes and not just single primes. And then let's look at the terms in the numerator. These are just correction factors to, to the prime number theorem that, that they made that were a part of the conjecture. So what we're really interested in, in is d of a comma b comma y. And what d of a comma b comma y measures is the contributions of longer patterns to these weird behaviors of uh, these, the, pair, the frequencies of prime patterns of length two. Uh, so let me tell you exactly what I mean by that. So consider the prime pattern one comma one. That is actually contained in the pattern one comma one comma one. So if I find a triple of primes that satisfies the pattern one comma one comma one, then we're guaranteed already that there are two occurrences of the pattern one comma one. So what d of a comma b comma y measures is how these longer patterns affect the frequencies of smaller patterns. So because a d of a comma b comma y sort of measures these contributions from longer patterns, it's natural to split d of a comma b comma y by the length of the patterns we're considering. And indeed, if we split d of a comma b comma y into these terms and evaluate the behavior of these terms, we can come up with uh, our main result, which is the following. Uh, let's take a length, a, a pattern length of n, then uh, Lemke, Oliver, and Sound propose a bound of the following form, and it's pretty complicated, but I've highlighted the part that's different from our result, and it's of a very similar form to our result. So what they, what they claimed but did not prove was this formula. And what we proved, which is a slightly weaker version, but is still of the same form, which is uh, reassuring, is this formula. OK. So when we're talking about conjectures in number theory, there are usually two main parts. Uh, the first, which we've already done, is uh, justifying our conjecture in terms of things that we think are true but not, might not have necessarily proved are true. And that's basically what we've just done. The second part is to compare it to the numerical evidence and make sure that it's at least in some way uh, bears some semblance to what the numerical evidence suggests. So uh, it turns out that when you're trying to calculate the exact prime frequencies, uh, prime pattern frequencies at very large primes, uh, it's pretty computationally intensive. So instead of directly co uh, computing these prime pattern frequencies, we can instead estimate the prime pattern frequencies by sampling. And so what we did was we sampled uh, intervals of primes, and we, uh, from those samples, we estimated the actual prime pattern frequencies at various values. And using this method, we managed to extend our data by eight orders of magnitude from 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 18. And in the next slide is just a graph of our extended data. So uh, if we look at this cutoff of 10 to the 10, that's about where uh, we stop computing exact results. And from here onward is uh, sampled data. And uh, as you can tell just from the general shape of this graph, uh, it fits in pretty well with the actual data. So that's uh, another reassuring sign that uh, what we did was uh, valid. And here's just a conjecture plotted for relatively small values. And you can see that the red, the red is the conjectured form, and the blue is the actual data. And uh, the general shape of the conjecture sort of matches the data, so that's another uh, evidence in favor of the conjecture. But if we zoom in, it turns out that there are these deviations. And these deviations actually look like there could be another term that is missing from the conjecture that was not accounted for. And so what we did was we just tried to identify this new term 
And what we did was we curve fitted with our extended data, and we found that the best fit was a term of this form, log log y squared over log y squared. And adding this uh, new term into our conjecture and, sub and uh, accounting for that, we subtracted and found the error, uh, and we reduced our error. Here's a graph of the error, and it turns out that we managed to reduce the error in the conjecture by an order of magnitude. So this seems like another promising result. So the takeaways, uh, prime patterns are not necessarily equally distributed, and there are sort of conjectured explanations for why these, uh, this weird uh, behavior occurs. Um, so what we did was we specifically placed the conjecture that uh, Lemke, Oliver, and Sound made on firmer footing, and then we extended a numerical, our numerical results to find a possible lower order terms of the conjecture that they omitted. And finally, in the future, we hope to extend a numerical, to create a numerical model that will more accurately model the behavior of these patterns. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to thank my mentor, Robert Berkland, uh, my tutor, Dr. John Rickert, the uh, head math mentors, uh, the, uh, the author of the paper, Robert Lemke Oliver, and also another professor, Lawrence Washington, and of course, all of my sponsors for allowing me to have this amazing experience. Thank you. So you were focused on the example for with three, but do you have similar uh, results, or can you say similar things if you were looking at uh, dividing through by bigger uh, Yeah, so the question was, um, I focused in the beginning of the talk mostly on the case of when we're dividing by three, but how, does this, how do these results generalize? So actually, um, my results do hold in general for prime, uh, when we're dividing by primes. The reason I chose three is that it's easier to get a handle of it, and uh, really, what I showed doesn't only apply to three. Yeah. I have to apologize. I understand it's a wrong question to ask mathematician. But having said that, do you envision any application of that time? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um... okay, so there are some possible applications. I'm not sure how. Uh, valid these might actually be, but so uh, cryptography, as you know, involves the, uh, so cryptography, uh, uh, they, so they have to use uh, number theory and pro properties of primes. So one might try to, uh, one might conjecture that if you could extend these results for long enough, uh, you could possibly look at the behavior of primes in relationship with each other and possibly have uh, applications in cryptography. Generators. Uh, random number generators? Uh, I'm not quite sure. The main problem with uh, applying these results to cryptography is that when, uh, when we're talking about cryptography, we usually pick primes of different orders of magnitude, and these are strictly consecutive prime sequences, so they're of the same size, while, whereas in cryptography, we're usually talking about primes with different orders of magnitude. Not use random number generators for cryptography. I'm asking if your results might be relevant to random number generators. Uh, I am not aware of any uh, applications of my results to random number generators, but that would be interesting to look at in the future. Other questions from the judges? Um, questions from the audience? Thank you.